2 Thessalonians chapter 1 in verse 1. The Bible says this, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace and God, from God our Father and, fr- and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you, of, of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. I'm going to preach you a message entitled tonight, Determined to Improve. Determined to Improve. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray you would help us, Lord, as we continue to worship you with determination, Lord, that we are determined to worship you in, in the midst of a culture and society and uh, agendas, Lord, that wish to stop that. And Lord, I pray that you would give us perseverance. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have determination, Lord, and that in this process, you would, we would see ourselves grow in our faith. Lord, help us to be growing Christians. Lord, we don't want to be stagnant. Uh, Lord, we don't want to go backwards. Uh, Lord, we don't want to backslide. Uh, but Lord, we want to grow for you, and we need your help to do that. And so, Lord, I pray that you would instruct us from your word. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, 2 Thessalonians is written not long after 1 Thessalonians and continues on the same theme of determination through persecution by having confidence in the return of the Lord. Paul continues the same ideas and the same theming. First of all, that they ought to have determination because these were a persecuted uh, people. And we saw that in the book of Acts as, as Paul was ushered out of the city and that persecution continued for the believers that were left behind at Thessalonica. Now you remember the first letter had the, had the had the joy that Paul had of learning that they had continued. They had not withered away. They had not vanished, but they were continuing on with determination. And so Paul here again reminds them and encourages them in their determination. Paul opens the second letter very much, almost exactly how he opened the first letter. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul said this, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. In other words, it begins with a, with a, a, a sense of thanksgiving, not condemnation, but thankfulness for their reception of the word of God. And in verse three, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God, our father, knowing brethren, beloved, your election of God. And so this same thankfulness that Paul began 1 Thessalonians with, he begins in 2 Thessalonians, but now their faith and their love and their patience was even abounding more and more. While these were the same people which he had written the first letter to, they were not in the same place spiritually. They had grown. They had grown. They they were not the same Christians. They they were the same personalities. But through trial and tribulation, through the exercising of their faith, through the exercising of love, these believers had actually grown. They had abounded. I I wonder in your life this year, when we began last January in, in this idea of being determined to worship Christ, have you grown in the Lord this year? Has your faith grown? Has your love grown? Has your patience grown? You see, it was in this growth that allowed Paul to reveal to them new things, to take them to the next level in the Christian walk. You you know, following Jesus and and growing in Jesus is never intended to be boring. It is supposed to be new every single day, but it is only new if you're growing. You ever had to think about the, the possibility of repeating a grade? Repeating it once, repeating it for the second time, you think, man, I've heard these same jokes. I've heard these same illustrations. I've done this. And you can imagine if a poor kid had to repeat the grade a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time. They're like, oh my goodness, this class is never ending. It's the perpetual second grade, whatever class they might be in. And the, the teacher would not have new jokes. There would be not be new lessons learned because the lessons they were supposed to learn in the second grade they hadn't learned yet. 
Your Christian walk becomes stale when you stop growing. But when you're growing, it's new every day. When you're growing, it allows the Lord to teach you something that you were not able to handle before. Paul, here in the second letter to the Thessalonians, is able, because of their growth, to reveal new things to them. But if you're not learning new things about God, I dare say you're not growing in God. If your Christian walk has become stale, it's because you're not growing. You're right where you've always been. But the challenge for us this evening is to grow. It is to continue. It's to be determined to improve. You remember the core teaching of the first letter was, was not that we, sh- was that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be caught up with the Lord. You remember Paul said this in, second, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. And so the whole letter was built, about, built upon the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, in particular, the rapture of the saints. And so Paul was building up the first three chapters to then bring them to this grand truth, this grand teaching, that they would have confidence that while they were in persecution, it would not go on forever, and that Jesus was going to return. And as Paul describes in other parts of the New Testament, it would be in the twinkling of an eye, and that we that were alive would not prevent them that are asleep, but that we should all be changed, and we should all be caught up with the Lord. He gives them this great knowledge of hope. He reveals this to them. Because they were enduring in faith and love and patience, they were able to receive this revelation of hope. But now in the second letter, and we'll cover this in a week or two, in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, Paul says this to them. He says, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, do you understand what he just did? See, when they were younger in the faith, he reveals to them this great hope of the Lord Jesus Christ's return. But he did not intend for them to stay there. And I would say at that milk of the word, as they grow, and in this verse, in verses three and four, really show their growth, uh, their growth in, 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 uh, uh, their growth in faith and their abounding in love and their endurance in patience. Paul realizes now that in their spiritual maturity, they, did, they could not only handle the, the, the milk of the Lord's return, but now they could handle the meat of the identity of the Antichrist. And Paul is going to lay on us in chapter 2 some of the meatiest parts of Scripture in identifying this son of perdition, the wicked one, Satan himself. Now, they were needing this information because of the persecution that they were under. They had been starting to receive false reports that perhaps they were already in that tribulation. And that while they were in a tribulation, Paul reminds them, you're not in the great tribulation. And because they're thinking about this, he is able to reveal something more to them. Paul reveals to them the name, or Paul reveals to them, he thought I was going to give it a name. Paul reveals to them the person of the Antichrist. Listen to this. Understand this statement. Greater spiritual growth will lead to greater spiritual understanding. That's why we grow. As you grow, God is able to show you more things that increase your faith, that cause you to love more and to have enduring patience. These believers at Thessalonica were growing. And because of that, Paul was able to reveal these more heavy and harder things to them. Remember, the, the message of the first book was very uplifting. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. But now they were at a spiritual maturity. He says, look around. And let me show you the identifying marks of this evil one. Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3 and 8 verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 
I think one of the saddest states for a believer to get to is a point where a, a point where they stop growing, where they stop growing, where they become stagnant. When you are not growing, you are not learning, and you're missing out on what God has for you to learn. This evening, I want to ask you this this question by form of proposition: Are you growing in faith, charity? And patience. Are you growing in faith, charity, and patience? Now, this this theme is not unique to the book of First Thessalonians. Regardless of circumstances, a major theme of the New Testament is the idea to continue to grow in faith, continue to go in charity, and to continue to grow in patience. These are, if you want to say, the spiritual thermometers of the believer's life. If you want to know whether you're growing or not, if you want to know whether or not your walk with the Lord is getting richer and deeper, if you want to know whether or not you're progressing in the Lord, then listen, your faith is going to grow. And if you're growing in the Lord, your charity is going to abound. And if you're growing in in the Lord, your ability to endure tribulation with with patience is going to increase as well. Beloved, if you find yourself decreasing in those areas, easily shaken, slow to charity, having no patience, then I dare say you are not growing in your Christian walk. First of all, are you growing in faith? Are you growing in faith? Look what he says here in verse 3. He says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren. Now, now, I love the way he enters it, uh, enters the conversation here, because from both letters, we get the indication that the Apostle Paul had nothing, for, had nothing for, but admiration and appreciation for the believers at Thessalonica. There's, he does not begin every letter in the New Testament this way. Some letters actually begin with, I can't believe that you're so easily removed or so soon removed, he tells to the Galatians. There is something about being the type of people that can hear sound doctrine, can hear strong preaching, and receive it that is appreciated by the ministers of God. Beloved, be that type of congregation. Be the type of people that the preacher is thankful for because they're so easy to preach to. In other words, they're so receptive of the Word of God, and you begin to see growth in their life. He says here, we we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, and then notice this, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Your faith groweth exceedingly. Let's spend a moment here and speak about faith. Faith is always about the object. Faith is always about the object. It's not about the quantity of our faith, but it's about the object of our faith. What, who, and what we have faith in. Our faith is in God based upon his word. And that's what Paul is is talking about here. Having a faith that grows, a faith who is in the person of God based upon the word of God. Beloved, where is your faith today? Where is the object of your faith? Now, if we were to hand out a doctrinal test, maybe we would say in the person of God based on the word of God. But if we were to take that same test and allow someone else to apply it to our lives by observation, they may say, well, that person puts their faith in their ability. That person puts their faith in their bank account. Well, that person puts their faith in their circumstances. I mean, that's the kind of Christian that every time everything's going good, they seem to be the happiest Christian in the world. But as soon as something goes bad, they're the most depressing Christian in the world. You see, faith is all about the object. Where is your faith? Our faith rests, first of all, in the person of God. Our faith has an object. I mean, it is a person. We have faith in the person of God that God can do what he says he can do. Our faith is built not on a hope so, but in a no so, and that no so is in the character and attributes of Almighty God. We've been preaching about that on Wednesday nights. But not only do we have, this, do we have our faith in, this, in the person of God, but the person of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has revealed to himself through his word. 
So he told us, have faith in me, and then he tells us how to express that faith or where to place that faith. This is what I have promised to do for you, and those things are found in the word of God. Our faith is based upon his, word, upon his person and upon his word. Now, why am I making this point? Because grab a hold of this. Our faith is not in faith. Our faith is not in faith. Our faith is not in our sincerity. Our, our, our faith is not in our religious activity. Uh, our faith is, is not in our heartfeltedness, our meaningness, our, our, our seriousness. See, there are many people today that place faith in faith. It doesn't, it doesn't matter the object of your faith as long as you are sincere in your faith. Just be sincere. Sincerely believe something. Uh, be genuine. But beloved, understand this. You can have faith in something that is not right and be wrong. So often believers are stumble upon this idea of having, is my faith strong enough? Do I have enough faith? Do I have the right kind of faith? But beloved, those aren't the right questions. The question you ought to ask yourself about your faith is, who is my faith in? That is the object. In what word is my faith in? What am I trusting? Who am I trusting and what am I trusting? Your faith is always about the object. And so what does Paul mean here when he says a growing faith? Your faith grows, catch this, your faith grows as your confidence in God and his word grows. That's growing faith. Growing faith is not growing religiousness. Gr growing faith is not growing sincerity. I mean it more today than I meant it yesterday. I'm more serious today than I was yesterday. That, that's not growing faith. But growing faith is an improved and increasing and growing confidence in who God is and what God has said. See, see faith, a growing faith is, is a person who has exercised this relationship with God personally and has exercised their, their faith in, in, in personally in his word and has seen it come true over and over and over again to the point where they get to the place, to, to, the, to, the, to the moment when they get to the point where they can say, I have no reason not to trust God. I have no reason not to believe his word. In other words, I, I've been down this path so many times with God. I mean, I, I've been in so many circumstances with God. I, I've been in so many uh, places, trials and tribulations. I, I've been to so many times where, where it was beyond me. It had to be all God. And every single time God, the person of God has shown himself faithful, I am coming now to this new circumstance in front of me, but I, have, I would be a fool not to trust God. In other words, my confidence has grown. My confidence has grown as I have allowed God the ability to show himself faithful. See, many people have a weak faith because they have a weak walk with God. They haven't had enough experiences with him. They haven't seen him as he walks with them through the valley of the shadow of death. They have not known him. And so when it, when it is time to call upon that personal relationship with him, it is non-existent. The exercise of faith will result in the growing of faith. The more you live by faith, the more confidence you will have in the person of God and in the word of God. What does that mean? You trust God. You believe his word. And listen, not in sentiment, not in empty sentiments, not in hallmark platitudes, not in 
prayer request, praises for prayer requests for prayers that were never offered. But I'm talking about really putting God to the test. Not because we are tempting God, but because God says, put me to the test. Believe me. Take me at my word. Trust me. And the more often a person does that, the greater their confidence grows in the person and word of God. The exercise of faith will result in the growing of faith. It's like a muscle, right? If you don't use a muscle, it will atrophy all the way to the point where it will be uh, non-existent. But the more you exercise a muscle, the more you strain a muscle, the more that you put confidence in that muscle, that it can lift the weight, that it can do the movement, that it can accomplish the exercise, that muscle by nature grows and grows and grows. And the ability of weight, the ability of movement, and the strength of maneuver only increases with the exercise of that. Paul is commending the believers at Thessalonica, you've been exercising your faith. I can tell. You ever gone up to an individual and say, you've been losing some weight. Have you been working out? I can tell. Well, it's obvious. When, when a person has been watching what they eat and ha has been putting in some work and you can see the physical changes that happen in their life. And so does happen in a spiritual Christian. Paul noticed the spiritual exercise that these believers were putting in. It was noticeable that their faith had increased. Well, let me be simplistic here. How do I exercise my faith? How do I exercise my faith? Not with greater sincerity and not with greater tryheartedness. Well, if, the, if faith is about the object, about the person of God and about the word of God, well, then how do I exercise my faith? And beloved, this is why these themes are not old, but they are fundamental to the growth of a believer. How do you exercise your faith? You ask yourself these questions. Am I reading and learning the Bible? Am I growing in his word? Am I learn, reading God's word, discerning God's word, and then applying God's word so as to become confident in God's word? I mean, what was the last time you had one of those moments where you said, you know what, the Bible says you ought to do this. You know, I'm going to give that a try. Uh, the Bible says you ought to do this with your finances. Or the Bible says you ought to do this with your family. Or, or the Bible says you ought to do this in your areas of separation in your life. You know what, I'm going to go ahead and take God at his word. I'm going to go ahead and try that. And then you look and you say, well, you just say, well, that really worked. Well, why would it work? It's the word of God. It works every time. And there is an exercise of faith. How do I exercise my faith? Am I reading and learning the Bible? How do I exercise my faith? Am I praying and trusting God? Am I praying and trusting God? Is prayer a ritual or a necessity? Is prayer a habit or something that you use as something that God has proven as powerful in your life? How do I exercise my faith? I read my Bible and apply it, and I pray to God, the person of God, and I trust him. And it works. And I do that a lot. The doctor recommends daily. <laughs> not, not, not Dr. J, doctor, the word of God, Dr. God. He recommends daily. Do this every day. If you do this every day, you'll be amazed what I will do in your life. If you do this every day, you'll be amazed at the confidence that I will build and that the object of your faith will grow in your heart and mind so that you would have no choice but to have confidence in him. What's the result of a growing faith? Your faith grows as your confidence in God and his word grows. What's the result of this? I want you to catch this. Here are the marks of a growing faith. First of all, I am, less, I am less hindered by fear. That's the result of a growing faith. A growing faith that has a growing confidence in God. Because he has not given us the spirit of fear. 
but of a sound mind. See, the evidence of a growing faith is a person who is less hindered by fear. Now, now listen, I'm not talking about the absence of fear. We're, we're humans, and, and so fe fearful things happen, but a confident Christian who is growing in faith is less hindered by fear. Are you still ruled by the same old fears? Are you still hindered by the same old fears? Or have you outgrown them? Have you grown beyond them? You know, when I, was a, when I was a little kid, I was afraid of the dark, but I outgrew it. I, I began to learn that there's really no, the monsters don't come out when the lights come off. That actually the same things were going on in the room with the lights on or off, and I actually have come to the point that I enjoy a dark room to sleep in. I don't need the nightlight anymore. It's like kind of nice. My confidence grew. That there wasn't a monster lurking in, the, lurking in the closet. I grew up. And beloved, it's time for some of you to grow in faith and not be hindered by the same old fears. The same old fears. You've got to overcome those by faith. Have you ever, listen, maybe you're, you're like me in this. That sometimes you come to a fear and you say, Oh, I'm going to avoid that one. And you say, I'm just going to go around this way. And nonchalantly, you kind of go around, but it seems like that every avenue you go down life, you come back to that very same fear. It always comes back to that same thing. It always comes back to that, to that, one, that, that one thing that holds you back, that fear. For some of you, it's time that your faith grows, that you are less hindered by fear. The result of a growing faith is, first of all, that I'm less hindered by fear. But secondly, the result of a growing faith is I am more confident to go by faith. I am more confident to go by faith. Everyone wants the sure thing. <clears throat> Everyone wants the victory after the fact. But a growing faith begins to have confidence in the person of God, begins to have confidence on the word of God, and doesn't need to have it all done already for them. But they begin to say, you know what? I think God, by his word, is leading me to do something. Oh, man, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, now, listen, that's not according to the financial plan that I set up in my life. Uh, but I think God, he's impressing me by the indwelt Holy Spirit and the inspired word. He is leading me to do something. But man, why would I do that right now in my life? Uh, the kids are not the right age. Uh, uh, my, my career is not in the right spot. My, whatever those circumstances might come. And to the novice Christian, they are held back. They can't go by faith yet. Their faith has not grown to say, oh, I can't get over these circumstances to take a step of faith of, that, of where I know God is leading me. But it's the growing Christian who is growing by faith, who has a growing confidence in the person of God, has a growing confidence in the word of God, knows the routine, has heard God speak to them about the little things so that when God speaks to them about the big thing, they can go, you know what? This makes no human sense. But I'm, I'm really confident God wants me to do this. I mean, I'm really confident he's given me a vision for my life. I'm really confident that he has shown me something. The spirit inside of me is being confirmed by the word of God. And I have a verse and, and God is showing me this is what I do. And you know, you know what? No one around me is going gonna, is gonna, to, those that don't know about these things aren't going to think that this makes any sense. But to those who are in the faith, they'll say, we got to follow God. And a growing faith is more confident to go by faith. To go by faith. Oh, and beloved, that's the sweet spot. That's the sweet spot. You, you know what's exciting about coaching a basketball game? Is I don't know what's going to happen. Now listen, if I knew that we were going to win every single game, that wouldn't be as much fun. 
I mean, it might look better on the record at the end of the year, but, but that wouldn't be as much fun. What, what's fun is going in and risking it. What's fun is putting it all on the line. What's fun is going out and seeing how the, the players are going to perform and, and seeing them accomplish and going by faith, if you want to say, and winning the victory. A growing faith is less hindered by fear, but a growing faith is also more confident to go by faith. Beloved, what was the last step of faith that God asked you to do? What was the last time in your personal walk with God, with the person of God and the word of God, that you came to a place saying, I really think God wants me to do that. And he just took a step of faith. <clears throat> For some of you, your next step of growth is going to come when you take that next step of confidence. God, I know this is what you want me to do. I'm just going to take that step, and I'm going to take it. Number one, are you growing in faith? Number two, are you growing in charity? Are you growing in charity? Paul said this, and the charity of every one of you all towards each other aboundeth. Now, here's the cool thing about this. Here was a church, and he describes some of the persecution in 1 Thessalonians, but in 2 Thessalonians, he gets more descriptive and more acknowledging of the persecution and tribulations that they were enduring. But this is what Paul was so thankful for. Here was the exciting thing. What Satan had determined to pull them apart was actually drawing them together. They were abounding and they were growing in charity one for another. Notice this, that in this church's context, pressure produced desire, not detachment. Pressure, external pressures that this church was facing, external pressures that these individual believers were facing in their life, the persecutions and tribulations that they were enduring in these people's lives had actually produced an increased desire one for another, an increased love one for another, not a detachment one from another. The adversary determines to pull us apart. But if we grow in charity, external pressure will actually bring us closer together. People in the military understand this, the brotherhood of the foxhole. To be in that same pressure together produces a love and a bond one for another. Persecution did not pull them apart, but engaged them closer together. Now, I want you to catch this. I want to ask you a convicting question. What does pressure, whatever form that might come in in your life, what does pressure do for you and those you love? What does pressure do? See, a, a growing Christian, a growing believer who's growing in faith, and abounding in love, will find that pressure draws them together, whatever context. Paul here is using the context of the local New Testament church. But let me ask you something. What does pressure do to your family? What does pressure do to your relationship with your spouse? Does pressure create increased desire or increased detachment? See, they were abounding in love one for another. In other words, their love, as pressure increased, as the odds became more insurmountable, they began to realize who is really on home team here? Who is really on my team? And they began to join themselves together and they began to love each other even more. Beloved, uh, when you find yourself in pressure, you must understand who your home team is. And you must, al you must allow pressure to draw you closer together, to cling harder one to another, to have a greater affinity for one each other, to have a greater desire, understanding that the people that you love in your life are the ones that have your back the most. And yet... If you find yourself in a decreasing Christianity, you will also find this is true. 
that as pressure increases, you detach yourselves from the ones you ought to be loving. You detach yourself from your love with the Lord. So I'm busy, pressure, stress, circumstances. Those things should not be drawing you away from God. They should be drawing you to God if you're growing. If your family relationships are healthy, external pressures that are put on upon you should not be drawing you away from each other, but should be drawing you closer to one another. You, you ought to be having this mentality. Listen, there's only one, there's home team here. We got to stick together. I mean, the shells are coming in. Uh, everything's going down, but we got each other. That's all that matters. And we're going to stick together in this. And there are testimony, the testimony of a family is that during the greatest hardships in their life, that they grew closest together, not fell apart. Beloved, I'm giving it to you straight right where it's at. Don't think ourselves more than what we are. If you find yourselves in your relationships and your contexts under pressure and they're not creating increased desire for the ones that you know you ought to love, then have the courage, be convicted of the Lord, confess that they are not right, and ask God to change your mind. What does pressure do for you and those that you love? Look what else happened here. Persecution did not pull them apart, but engaged them closer together. But persecution also increased participation. Participation grew every one of you all. And the charity of every one of you all towards each other abounded. Let me be quick with this. Let me get back to the context of a, New Test a local New Testament church. Love in a congregation is not measured by the exercise of one individual, but rather by the participation of many individuals. The, the way we judge or the way we grade whether or not we're a loving congregation is not by holding forth our most loving person. Not, not, by, not, by, not by holding, I'm going to use Pastor Mike here as an example. If Pastor Mike is our champion per man of love. It's a title, you can have it. And like, no one can love like, I mean, I'll tell you, Pastor Mike is our Goliath of love. I mean, there is never, there's not a person he can't love. There's not a situation he can't love through. And so when we are put to the test on whether or not we're a loving church, we put up Pastor Mike and we go, you see, we're a loving church. That's not how it's measured in a church. The, the measure of love in a congregation is not measured by one individual, but by the participation of many individuals. It's not about how much one person loves. It's about how many of you are loving each other. That's the measurement. Love in a congregation is not measured by the exercise of one, but rather by the participation of many. Your charity or love grows as your selflessness and scope increases. Are you growing in charity? If you're growing in charity, then these two things are true you're becoming more selfless in love. You're becoming more selfless in love. You are able to love more with less promise of return. That's the increase in love. Abounding in charity means that you're able to be more selfless in love. I can love more and expect less. That's the mark. Beloved, can you love those around you without expecting anything in return? You know, in, in a marriage relationship, if you would grab hold of this idea of selflessness, 95% of relational issues would be taken care of. Because 95% of, and I'm just throwing that out, I'm making that statistic up on my mind, but it's high. I'm making it up on the spot, but it's high. Most marital issues stem from this idea. 
I'm not getting what I deserve. And I'm doing all of this, and they're not giving me what I deserve, or what I want, or what I got to have. That's not selfless love. That's not selflessness. But as charity increases, your ability to love with no need of reciprocation. You're not loving in order to get love back. You're not loving in order to get something in return. But you're loving simply because the Bible says to love and that God has put this person in your life to be loved and I am just going to love them no matter what. That is selflessness. That is when charity grows. Ask yourself this. How much can I love so-and-so with nothing in return? Your charity grows as your selflessness grows, but your charity grows also as your scope increases. Let me put this in the context of a church. It's easy to love lovable people. <laughs> There's some people that are just easy to love. Man, that, that guy is just the greatest guy in the world. Nicest guy ever. I mean, that guy never has a crossword, always has a great attitude. It's always 100%. That guy is easy to love. But that's not the measure of increased charity. See, increased charity not only has a mark of increased selflessness, but it also has an increase in scope. The range of people I am able to love. In other words, I can, only, I can love not only the lovable, and I can love not only the people that I'm supposed to love because I'm related to them or because I'm married to them, but I can also love the unlovable. I can also love the ones that make it hard to love them. Can you believe those people exist? I mean, there, there are some people that are unlovable. In other words, they don't, they don't uh, bring a lot to the table or, or, they're, or they, they don't receive it well or whatever. But then there are some that are actually make it hard to love them. Like every time you try to love on them, they just throw it back. It's weird. But the scope of your love increases. You're able to love the unlovable. Lastly. Are you growing in faith? Or are you growing in charity? Lastly, are you growing in patience? Are you growing in patience? Verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Patience is defined as your ability to hold the line while the fight increases. That's what, Paul, that's what Paul is talking about here. In other words, Paul is saying the tolerance, the ability to endure, the ability to hold the line as the fight begins to increase. Defines patience. Notice what they were experiencing here at Thessalonica. All your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, they were experiencing pointed persecutions. They were being singled out. They were being singled out. That this wasn't generic persecutions. This wasn't simply cultural persecutions. But this was the first Baptist church at Thessalonica was being pointedly persecuted. In other words, it was coming right at them. And patience is there was their ability, and Paul is commending them on their patience to endure persecution and not quit, not run away, not to abandon their posts, and not to leave the line. Beloved, this is, this is, this, this is a point and an idea that is going to, be, it's going to grow in relevancy for us today in the state of Michigan. Lord, uh, beloved, it's not simply that we're under cultural persecution. And it's not simply that we enjoy or encourage that our church is in the fight to push against the culture. But what happens if and when that day comes that the pressure and the persecution becomes pointed? Not simply all you Christians. And, and not simply you crazy Baptists. But what happens when it's in the newspaper and it says, Emmanuel Baptist Church? 
and there's a singled out. And the pressure and the persecution comes right at us. Will there be a patience to endure? These believers, Paul commends them for their patience to endure. Beloved, but that's a point that ought to be applied to your life as well. Many people are willing to endure persecutions or pressures when it's, pers- when it's general. But what happens when it comes to you? To you specifically? What happens when it's not about all you Christians? And what happens when it's all those people there at Emmanuel Baptist Church? But what happens when it comes out to you? You by name, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family. And they think you're the crazy one for Jesus. Are you going to bail on the line or are you going to have patience in tribulation? In other words, are you going to hold the line and and stay in your place and endure? See, they were witnessing or experiencing pointed persecutions, but they were also experiencing terrible tribulations. Hardships that were designed to cause them to quit. That's what they were experiencing. The attempt of the enemy was to cause them to quit. This is the devil's motive. The devil brings tribulation in your life to cause you to want to quit. Your patience is growing as your ability to endure grows. As your ability to endure grows. Hey, can you withstand more than you could withstand before? Have you grown in your tribulation? Have have you grown in the amount of adversity that you can handle in your life? I mean, mean, we've all known that. There there are those Christians that, that can't handle any adversity whatsoever. Once their faith in Christianity becomes a little bit inconvenient, they altogether quit. But the growing believer grows in patience. They're able to endure more. Can you endure more hardship? When I was a baby, I was one of those criers about shots. Any of your kids like that? I mean, I knew I was going to the doctor to get a shot. I was throwing a fit in the car. I was throwing a fit in the waiting room. I was throwing a fit in the doctor's office. I was one of those kids that was screaming in the other room. This week, I had to go get a root canal, and it was not a good one. Oh, my goodness. And one of the the nerves that they had to get to, the way it was situated, they couldn't numb it. And so he had to drill it out with no Novocaine or whatever they put in there. And I am telling you, he was lighting me up. I I was sitting back in that chair, and he would touch that nerve, and my right leg would kick up. I was afraid I was going to hit the other, the, 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 the aide, the, 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 per, the person that was helping him there. And so he would pull back the thing, and I would just start laughing. And he goes, why are you laughing? Because I'm like, Doc, you are lighting me up, and if I don't laugh, I'm going to cry. This hurts so bad. Now listen, I got to tell you, when I was a kid, I would not have been able to endure that. I would have been screaming, Murder. I mean, they would have had to have no gas, everything. They would have passed me out. There was no way that I was going to endure that. But you know what? I'm not a kid anymore. I'm a grown man. And it's just pain. I mean, it doesn't feel good, but it's just pain. It's a temporary feeling. And how bad I was feeling before, I was like, listen, whatever you got to do now to make that stop, I can do it for 10 seconds. Do your dirty work. Let's just get this done. Now, why could I handle that with some maturity and rationality? Because I'm a man. Because I'm older. Because I'm more mature. And beloved, some of you need to become more, in, more mature about the things you have to endure. Now listen, it might not be fair. It, it might be hard. It might be uncomfortable. But that is all right. Endure it. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Endure it. We'll see this in the next verse. Paul actually says that the persecutions that they were under were a a token that the Lord Jesus Christ was allowing them to have for his glory. Beloved, are you growing in faith? Are you growing in charity? 
Are you growing in patience? Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Lord, help us. Lord, we want to be growing Christians. Lord, help us to grow. Help us to grow.